the scientist has an opportunity. And I think it's a unique opportunity, and that is to create novel works of art that no one else in the world can. And one of the main points of my talk here is that these opportunities are being enabled by current and emerging forms of technology, which are only going to grow and multiply in the coming 50 years. Also, technologies which are almost exclusively available to scientists. So on my first slide here, uh, we have two images, one by world-renowned photographer Ansel Adams, and another by one of the millions of unknown graduate students across the world. <laughs> and I put these images here for two reasons. Uh, first, it's to simply admire and compare their relative aesthetic quality, despite their incredible differences in scale. So even though their scale differs by about 10 orders of magnitude, we can hopefully all agree there's some level of aesthetic value to each of them, and depending on your preference, you may even like the one on the right better. Now, the second reason I put these images here is to think about how they were taken, especially this one on the right. This was taken with a scanning electron microscope, probably a million-dollar piece of equipment to which very few people in the world have access to. Now, talented artists and photographers like Ansel Adams and many others didn't have and still don't have access to these kinds of technologies. But if they did, don't you think they would see the value in images like these and preserve them as timeless works of art? But they don't have access to these technologies. We do, scientists do. So it is thus our responsibility as scientists to recognize and preserve these images as we have unique access to these hidden corners of our world um, through the technologies that we use every day. So where do we look as scientists for these images? So the bottom is certainly a great place to start. And as we all know, there's plenty of room there, uh, not only for science, but also for art, I think. Now here I've compiled a number of microscope images at different scales, all taken here at Caltech, by myself and many others. Uh, we have some scanning electron microscope images like this one. We have some very nice optical microscope images, as well as even a transmission electron microscope image. Now, the sheer scope of this is just fascinating. So consider the scale or the field of view of a given camera, for example, or even an artist's eyes, for that matter, and compare this with the scale of one of these microscopes. So if you go through the numbers, on average, it's about 10 to the 7 times difference in scale, which is 10 million times difference. But we're talking about a two-dimensional image here, so we have to square that scale, and we get 10 to the 14. So that's 100 million million times difference, or 100 trillion times. So that's, what that means is, for every photograph that's ever been taken, there's 100 million million times more area there to be explored in the microstructure. That's an incredible number. If that number was a number of images or a number of photographs, there would be more photographs than have ever been taken in the history of the world combined. So it's quite incredible. So going through these with me, hopefully you all agree that they're all quite beautiful, and there's no reason, I don't think, why images like these should not be hanging on the walls of art museums across the world next to images of the world's macrostructure. In fact, some of them have. This image here by the Rukas Group at Caltech was actually on exhibit and is in the permanent collection of MoMA at New York. And a number of speakers in this session actually have been creating, uh, selling and exhibiting images like these for years. And that's great, it's really great, but I think there should be a lot more of this. Given the scales that I just mentioned, I think there should be a lot more of these images out there. So another area where I think scientists can create unique art is through images obtained with um, computer simulations and from graphical representation of complex data sets. So here I've put images first from computer simulations looking at the time evolution of the electromagnetic field through various nanostructures. Also some, some very nice images from Caltech here looking at complex fluid dynamics. As well as lastly an image in the middle right here from a data set which is looking at internet usage. So these are all quite nice, and I think it's important to note that none of these images could have been produced some 20 years ago. They're all possible in some way through new technologies, which are rapidly growing in use and in scope. Over the next 50 years, we're going to see a lot more people using these technologies, a lot more of these images being produced. I just hope we can preserve the beautiful ones. Okay, so what is my main point with all this, as I'm sure you've gathered, is that science can be beautiful. But people need to recognize this. Scientists and non-scientists alike need to recognize this. But it starts with the scientists, and that's the important part. Scientists need to be aware that this kind of value exists in their everyday work so that they can recognize these images and preserve them and they're not lost forever. So I have a task for everybody watching, um, scientists or not, if you work with images. The next time you're going through your data or looking through a microscope, take a second to think if there's an image here that you could preserve strictly for its visual appeal. If there is, I want you to capture it, then I want you to email it to me. <laughs> I'll take good care of it, I promise. Um, okay, so lastly, I'd like to say that um, I think it's not only artistic progress that can be made here, but also um, scientific progress. So one of the main ideas that was thrown around at that moment exhibit I just mentioned is that often when you're designing some kind of scientific device or system, usually the designs that are the most aesthetically pleasing are the ones that tend to work the best. And I think this is true. 
In fact, when Watson and Crick were looking for the structure of DNA, they built these 3D models and to help themselves visualize it. And when they came across this beautiful double helix, it looked so nice to them, they just sort of knew it had to be right. So in closing, I'd like to say that I think that uh, the spirit and the curiosity of Richard Feynman demand us all as scientists to explore these hidden corners of our world, recognize all of the value that is there, to preserve it, and to make it accessible to the rest of the world. Thank you.